um, more detail. Today I'm going to concentrate on these two and then next week we'll finish with the last three. But just to give you a sense, it's the raising of Christ on the cross here and then um, the descent from the cross here, them taking his body down. Then in the middle one, it's the, um, they're entombing him in um, the sepulcher. The fourth one is the resurrection, and the fifth one is the ascension. These are also very appropriate images because uh, Rembrandt's view, as especially you'll see today, is a very Protestant one. So that works very well for us because a lot of the imagery that we see throughout the history of art and up until the end of the 17th century, I am a Dutch 17th century specialist, so I do anything before the 18th century better than I do anything after that. Uh, but most of the uh, imagery that was created was for the Catholic Church. And, you know, initially uh, when uh, there was the, the schism, the, the separation and the reformation, then there was a lot of um, uncertainty about how images should be used or if they should be used in uh, you know, church settings. And in many cases, especially in the Netherlands, they went through and destroyed all of the Catholic imagery. Um, Martin Luther um, thought that there was a role for imagery in, in churches and in a devotional sense. And John Calvin came around to that later also. So these were images that were created for this individual here. This is Frederick Hendrick. Um, it's a portrait that was done of him in 1631, so right at the time this imagery was being created. He was the ruler of the Dutch Netherlands. So there were seven provinces um, in what today we know as the Netherlands. And um, prior to that, the Netherlands had been joined with what is now Belgium, uh, which remained primarily Catholic. They had been one entity controlled by the Spanish, uh, the Spanish crown. And so the Netherlands was separating out. They uh, became Protestant. And this was painted of that ruler, Frederick Hendrick, who, um, so this is all kind of a fun play today, but his grandson, was William the second, became William the second of England, who married uh, one of the Stuart um, rulers. So there are some in my family who think that we are tied to that uh, royal line. Um, and the grandson William, who married uh, Mary, a, a Stuart princess, um, moved into Ireland and was, you know, uh, working with that conflict in Ireland, and the northern provinces stayed, uh, oh, became um, Protestant, and my great-grandparents on my mother's side were from that area. That's why I wear orange, um, because they were of the House of Orange, which was actually a French province. It becomes very convoluted, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so he was, he was not a king. Uh, the Netherlands now has a monarchy, but he was not. He was the Stadthouder. He was the military and the political ruler. And he was working to um, embellish his court because his peers were the King of England, the King of Spain, you know, the royalty in France and in Italy. So he's wanting to uh, decorate, embellish his residence with imagery that rivals those other courts. And he had help in doing that. The other uh, individual there is his secretary, Constantine Hawkins. Um, that painting dates from 1641, so a little later. Uh, Constantine 
was a very well-educated individual. He was um, connected with individuals, again, throughout much of Europe. And um, he <clears throat> was corresponding with them. And he was also working to, again, enhance the, the credibility, the reputation, the uh, appearance of the Dutch uh, uh, court. And so he um, saw Rembrandt's paintings, and um, <clears throat> he wrote about Rembrandt in his autobiography in 1630. So again, right before these paintings were uh, created, that he believed that despite their um, inferior teachers, that Rembrandt and, oh maybe I should just go to this. So, crucified. And that version is um, by a pupil, friend, um, co-student, uh, a man uh, by the name of Jan Levens. Both of these paintings were actually commissioned by Constantine Hawkins for Frederick Henry. <clears throat> so Hendrik, or sorry, Constantine writes that despite their inferior teachers, he believes that Rembrandt and Jan Levens would soon surpass Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, he believed that Rembrandt was better at portraying the essence of his subjects, and he makes his works more vivid. So <coughs> clearly the, the two painters were given some direction. They were given um, the direction of putting it within a, an oval, format, which is the format then that was followed for the rest of the five paintings. And they're both set against these dark backgrounds so that the, the body of uh, Christ, in both cases, <coughs> nailed to the cross, um, stands out. And uh, as I said, this one was judged to be more realistic. Christ seems to be uh, more in agony as he's communicating with God the Father in these moments before his death. I have a question. So, the body of Christ there looks beautiful. He, it doesn't look as though he was tortured prior to his crucifixion at all. But in the passages of the Bible, the Romans did um I think that well I don't know why he's not showing them I mean on the Levens you can see that the blood has run down his side from the the piercing um, by the spear um you know, I'm sure there was some reason for that. I don't know um, why he would have <coughs> um, chosen to do that. Uh, but the idea was that, you know, it was it. It's that moment I think more of the communication um, between Christ, the man, and his heavenly Father at, as they're as they're dying. Um, so these are the first two paintings that Rembrandt did. So Rembrandt won the commission, and all of the paintings have the curved top, but not all the images that you find on the internet have the curved top, and this was one of the better ones, so that's why it's not showing up here. And <clears throat> what you have here is the raising of the cross, and then Christ coming down from the cross. And Rembrandt was chosen also in part because he was trying to be very faithful to uh, the world around him. So he was, you know, observing things. He was trying to put that into his paintings, which included uh, facial features and gestures to convey mm -hmm. the, the, you know, weight of the story. Um, and I, I'm just showing these to you so you kind of get them in your mind because 
when Constantine Hawkins wrote that he thought Rembrandt's was going to surpass Rubens, you need to know what the Rubens look like. So before we get there though, sorry. So this is the raising of the cross, which is not really um, a typical scene through the, the history of art. Usually Christ is already on the cross. So this raising of the cross was kind of a new element, and I think it was being introduced right during this time period at the end of the 1500s and into the early 1600s because it's a little more dramatic. So it's not strictly biblical, but obviously for Christ to have been raised, he had they had to have gone through some kind of process. <clears throat> So that's a new thing where you can't really trace that through art. But what you can see are these images of, you know, the taking down of his body, which is often called the deposition uh, from the cross. So here, this is um, an Italian one. It dates from 1432 to 34, and it's about six foot by six foot. And on the other side is a Flemish image, so think, you know, Belgium today, Belgium, um, by Roger van der Weyden, and that dates from about 1435. So essentially contemporary, which is one of the reasons I picked the two. And you can see that, that they, you know, he's already been detached from um, the cross, and they're just in the process of lowering the body down. And in this version, you can see there are a multitude of players. Um, people are holding, and you've got um, Mary Magdalene here kissing his feet. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, it's set in front of a Italian countryside, and it's a very um, a busy scene, I guess. And the van der Weyden is also sort of a busy, crowded scene because the figures are larger and you don't have any kind of background. Uh, but this, was a, this became a very influential painting, the van der Weyden, because of the, you know, the uh, emotions that are depicted on the faces of the individuals who are surrounding uh, Christ there. Uh, and this was commissioned by a, um, a militia group and the archers. And if you look at Christ's body, it's kind of in the shape of a crossbow, mm. um, which was a subtle nod to that, the commissioning group. Um, and again, it, a lot of, um, attention to rich fabrics and the detailing in, um, this is probably Joseph of Arimathea there in the very um, rich robe. And there, the faces may include members from the uh, militia group who were commissioning this work. Uh, this one's also very large, it's seven by uh, eight almost nine feet, so <clears throat> large paintings. But you can see that it's, you know, it, it's a different moment than what Rembrandt was depicting. So this is the Rubens painting. It's the raising of the cross. It was done in 1610 and 1611 and was intended for the Cathedral of Our Lady in Antwerp. Actually, no, that's where it is now. Um, it was actually intended for another church in Antwerp that has since been destroyed. So they've moved it into the cathedral. And it was uh, primarily funded by a wealthy merchant in Antwerp. And it is three panels that, uh, I mean, large altarpiece, it's 11 by 15 in total. And these side panels um, are able to close 
so at certain times of the year they close the, the panels cover up this section and there's paintings on the back side which I'll show you but um, so here you have a variety of women reacting to this event you have uh, John and um, for our purposes here I say I'll, I'll call her the Virgin because there can often be a lot of Marys in the picture and then you have this uh, group a large number of very large men working to raise Christ on the cross and then over on this side you can see the Roman um, soldiers pointing and uh, the other two thieves being prepared to be crucified. But the emphasis is on the, the drama of Christ being raised on the cross. And again, this was one of um, the few, one of the first moments when this particular uh, scene was being depicted. So Rembrandt in his commission is in part responding to this, <clears throat> this event. And Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, at this time was considered the premier painter in Europe. Um, he lived and worked in, was part of the uh, Belgian court, and he was Catholic, but he served as a diplomat for the Spanish crown, and so he made trips to England, he made trips to Spain, he spent time in the early part of his career, he spent several years in Italy, traveling around, um, copying images, so that he, you know, came back and had this large body of works in his uh, background, and then he utilized that imagery into and put it into his paintings. <clears throat> so in his depictions, which well reflected the Counter-Reformation um, take of how art should be functioning for the faithful, you know, God is depicted as being victorious, he's triumphant. So he utilized those classical Roman sculptures, Rubens did, to you know, imbue his figures. So Christ here is a very heroic figure uh, being raised on the cross. Um, he, he's looking heavenward, but we don't see, again, uh, much agony, I think. I mean, it's, it's more of a, <clears throat> an event. And then all of these um, figures here that are working to raise him are also um, influenced by those those images that Rubens had seen in, in Italy, um, in Rome. And in fact, some of these might be influenced by Michelangelo's uh, figures too. <clears throat> um, so in case anybody's going to ask, there's a dog here in the foreground. <laughs> and at this uh, time period, um, I think, dogs were becoming faithful companions. So, you know, we a lot of dogs are named Fido, uh, faithful. And so it's um, seen as a, a reference to that fidelity, that faithfulness. Um, and <clears throat> in these stories. And then this is Rubens's um, descent from the cross which is also then in the St. Antwerp, or in Antwerp Cathedral. And this one is from a couple years later, 1612 to 14. It's also very large, 14 by 11, so similarly sized. Uh, very impressive paintings. And this one has sort of a, a different theme to it. And, and the people receiving his body, this is John, um, the evangelist, 
and here's the Virgin, and here are a couple of the Marys, Mary Magdalene and another Mary. And <clears throat> this is uh, Joseph of Arimathea and probably Nicodemus, and then two other individuals helping lower his body. So John is essentially receiving the body as it's coming down. And there's this idea, this theme of Christ bearing. So here, you see the interaction with the Virgin, Mary, coming and interacting with Elizabeth, her cousin, and Mary is pregnant, so she is bearing Christ here. And then on that side, it's uh, when they take Jesus as an infant into the temple and Simeon takes him and you know, sings that song of praise as he's holding, um, as he's bearing Christ. Uh, <clears throat> so these are, um, as I said, Rubens was the premier painter across Europe because he used such strong colors. He used such strong figures. Um, you can see the emotional interactions between people and his gestures were very, um, you know, clear to the viewers too. And both Rubens and then Rembrandt will pick this up. You can see that there's a contrast between the white of the shroud that's behind Christ and the white of his body. So there's, you know, attention to detail and strong, um, strong emphasis in those color changes. Um, I, I don't think there's a river here. I think this is, you know, the, the background. I mean, there's like vegetation back here, maybe far back there in the background, but, um, yeah, that's the trick. Actually, up here, there's an eclipse. We're getting ready for the eclipse. You know how it said in the Bible, it becomes dark. And so Rubens has depicted that as the moon moving across the, the sun up there. <clears throat> so this is what on the outside of one of these panels, on the outside of one of these, I think it must be on this one. Um, but this is Christopher carrying Christ. Um, was that in the prayer this morning? No. Why was I thinking that that was actually, it came out somehow. But uh, Christopher was a saint identified by the, the Catholic Church. And he, I don't know, there, were, there was an interaction where uh, Christ as a child needed to be carried across. And Christopher did that and then later realized that he was uh, um, carrying Christ. So that's where the name Christopher comes from, Christ bearer. Um, and that ties into that whole altarpiece. But it's not in the Bible, is it? No, no. Many of the stories of the saints that the Catholic Church um, took on are not included in the Bible. Um, but, you know, for them, and when you're thinking, um, what, 2,000 years ago, when you have uh, illiterate uh, individuals that making these stories relevant to, and you know, there were early martyrs who were being, um, well, they were being martyred for their faith. And so, you know, just like St. Patrick is not in the Bible, but he was the, one of the um, monks who, you know, went to Ireland and um, helped evangelize the countryside. And so, there is that, that they were utilized to help make the faith more realistic and um, more relatable to people. So here's the contrast between Rubens 
um, raising and Rembrandt's raising there. Again, when Rembrandt was given this commission, he was a 25-year-old artist just kind of starting out. Rubens, by this time, was a well-established, well-known artist. Constantine Hawkins is saying he believes that Rembrandt is going to surpass Rubens, um, even though Rembrandt never traveled. He went, never went to Rome. He never did any of that. In part, he said he could see a lot of that because prints were being made of a lot of the images and they were circulating, so he had access to that. Uh, but he believed that, you know, through his ability to um, take in the natural world uh, and to translate that into um, metal and to silk and to hair, you know, that he didn't necessarily need to, to travel and to um, do what Rubens had done. So, um, again, Rubens's painting shows a lot of uh, movement, you know, a lot of uh, people moving and straining and lifting and a strong diagonal that's pulling us, the viewer, in because we're standing here at that, the bottom. Rembrandt, um, with kind of a different kind of parameter, also utilizes the diagonal of the cross but it's one where we have to kind of come to it. And um, somebody recently said that with the Rembrandt, you just kind of wish you could like clean it up so you could see it better. Because you're all sitting there going, I can't really see. Um, but the, the truth is, I mean, that was what he wanted us, his viewers to do, was to get up nose to nose with them. And we can't do that because if you get that close in the museum, you'll set off the, um, Alarms, which we did uh, when we were there. <laughs> so, you know, it's the paintings are much smaller, but they're meant to draw you in. And of course, when he was painting them for his patrons, they could get as close as they wanted to or needed to, to kind of see the details. But I think that they still work because there's still that element where we're like trying to see it and trying to get pulled into it. So I tried to blow it up. Um, I don't know if this helps at all. But with the, the Rembrandt, <laughs> there are these men here in the, on the um, left side. And these are intended to be the rulers of the synagogue who have come out to um, enjoy the, the crucifixion of this, you know, problematic um, preacher who is claiming to be the son of God. So you see uh, various heads, they're gesturing, they're pointing, they're intended to be mocking, and they're intended to be laughing. And then you have, um, there are actually five individuals who are working to raise the cross up. And there's this spade here to show you that they've dug down. So one of the emphases that Rembrandt always had with these biblical depictions was he's trying to, to make sure that you understand it was an actual historical event. This is not a mythological thing. This is not something made up, but he wants you know, to convey the fact that this was um, an actual historical event, which was very in keeping then with this Protestant um, view of the imagery and the, the patronage. So they dug a hole for the, the base of the cross. This Roman soldier is pulling on the um, footrest where uh, Christ's two feet are nailed separately in this case, and he's pulling this way, and there are um, three individuals behind who are pushing from the back side, um, 
And one individual here has his mouth open, he's pushing, he has bare feet. Um, another one, you know, you kind of see them in there. And then there's this individual here, which we will come back to later, but he's wearing a beret and he's wearing kind of a um, nice, fancy um, uh, tunic. And in part, that may have been, you know, he's wear what he's wearing is something that his patron, Frederick Henrik, might have worn also. So there's some kind of a connection trying to be made there, you know, that this is you. I mean, we are all um, complicit in the, in the need for Christ's uh, crucifixion. And then on the side back there are the other thieves being, you know, taken, um, they're bound. And then here, where you can't see them, are the women. <clears throat> and I can't see them here either, so, but they are there. So then the contrast of Reuben's descent and Rembrandt's descent from the cross. This painting, Rembrandt actually probably saw in a print. So there had been prints that were made of this and were circulating. So he might have seen it. And um, I think that, you know, there are similarities between the two. And in uh, both you have the white shroud that's been, um, you know, serving as a backdrop as the, the cloth that's, you know, helping handle. So um, it kind of prov provides some separation between Christ and the body. Reuben's uh, figure of Christ is, again, that heroic figure. Uh, <clears throat> and very, you know, well-muscled, well, um, well, just kind of a beautiful figure, where Rembrandt's Christ is uh, much more hmm, every man, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, he's not particularly well-muscled or uh, heroic looking there, but he actually looks like a, a dead figure with a, you know, slumping, a body that's slumping in death. And um, the, the individuals here um, are all working to touch the body of Christ. You can see that almost everybody has their hand on him, which would have tied into that sense of the sacrament, the body and blood, Holy Communion. So um, as part of the Catholic theology at this point, you know, there was that emphasis on the sacrament of Holy Communion, and this is um, kind of playing that out. Uh, it is interesting that in the, the Rembrandt, there, um, there is an individual here who is receiving um, the body, He's not specifically identified as John, like this individual, uh, but he is, you know, catching the body as it is coming down. And with the onlookers, so here you have the Marys here, um, two of the apostles here, and this would be Joseph of Arimathea there. <clears throat> Shauna. Yes. On um, the Rubens on the right hand side, what is that man holding in his hand? The the guy above John? Maybe it's just an opening in the um from where the Here? cross is that he's holding something or is that just the backdrop? That's his elbow, I think. Oh. So he's kind of coming down the ladder, I okay. think, and he's holding uh, maybe part of the shroud there. Okay. I don't know. It's a little hard to make out. Okay. But that's what it looks like to me. Um, and the Rubens are all bodybuilders. Sorry? They're, they're all bodybuilders. Yeah. Muscle. Yeah, because that's that heroic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's 
you know, Rubens had gotten that from going to Rome and, you know, copying those Roman and Greek statues because that was really the only source for nude bodies. <laughs> um, so, you know, Rembrandt didn't um, always have those same kind of resources. But again, it was meant to be more of a um, more personal interaction with Christ and the body. Um, but I do want to point out that this individual here is who's holding the body is also, he's got his uh, mouth open and, um, you know, he's right above the, the blood um, there and he's holding the body. So it's, it's a little bit of um, a Catholic element, actually. It's that receiving the body and blood, too. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, the explanations that I read said that, you know, it was kind of a, a nod to um, not only the, the Catholic, um, because there were Catholics that were coming through the house of the ruler, but, um, you know, so it, it just made it a little more um, interesting. And then, again, I tried to blow it up. So here you can see the Marys <coughs> and um, the, the, there are actually more of the disciples back here, but you can really only see these two who are, you know, uh, mourning and twisting their hands and, and reacting in sorrow. So kind of a big change. Well, wait, maybe I should do this. Okay. So I pointed out this figure and this figure. Um, and it is quite probable that these are self-portraits of Rembrandt. And so this is the end wall of the Sistine Chapel, the Last Judgment. Here's a Christ in majesty. And right kind of below him is the figure of um, St. Bartholomew, the disciple Bartholomew. And Bartholomew in the uh, traditions was flayed alive as his martyrdom. So he's holding his flayed skin there. Mm. Um, and the face on that flayed skin is a self-portrait of Michelangelo. <laughs> so there's a tradition of um, artists including themselves in some of these paintings, not necessarily entirely as a, you know, I'm there, I'm becoming famous, but rather if they were as well known as these three men, as you're going to see, were, it's, they're the stand in for every man, every person. So, you know, how do you have something and you make it contemporary, especially last judgment, um, but how do you make this an image that can relate to you, the viewer at that time, you put somebody in it that you can know. And actually there are several um, several of these individuals who are portraits of contemporary people. But, <clears throat> and this is back to the Rubens. This is a self-portrait of he and his wife, his first wife. And then you look at this figure here and there he is including himself in the raising of the cross again to demonstrate that he we are all complicit in the sins of the world that necessitate necessitated the crucifixion of christ and then back to the rembrandt so as i pointed out the first time that this you know he's wearing this tunic that would have been very contemporary it's very um wealthy, um, fine fabric. It might have been something that his patron would have worn, Frederick Henrik, but this is intended to be Rembrandt standing in as every man. Um, so he's not including himself as a, um, you know, saying something about him specifically, 
although, I mean, it certainly works that way over the centuries, <laughs> um, but it is intended to be him, um, you know, putting himself in there as <clears throat> every man that we're all complicit, which, again, he's a rising star in the, in the Netherlands, and so, you know, he is a figure that would have been known. It would have worked well for that. Same depiction, and then you can see both of these individuals have, you know, some of his features. So again, he's uh, including himself in in those um, in those scenes because these were really meant to be devotional images. They're really meant to involve us viewers. So. That's where we'll end today. 